Okay, thank you. Let's start our second session. The next talk is by Dr. Russ Taylor from South Africa. Russ. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, I have to use this one. Please, sorry. You can use your pocket. Microphone on? Yes. No. Good. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the uh, <coughs> the, the second um, flagship proposal uh, for the BRICS collaboration, and my proposal is focused on on big data, uh, <coughs> and really it's uh, it's a proposal that that really addresses the innovation challenges that we're going to be confronted with as we move into the petascale era of astronomy, and in particular, uh, multi-messenger astronomy. It's a challenge that cannot be addressed by astronomers alone. Right? So, so this proposal uh, brings together computer scientists and software developers and astronomers to work together in addressing those challenges. And, uh, we really are facing a fundamental transformation in the way astronomy is done as we move into the era where data sets are petascale uh, data sets. And so uh, it does require sort of a, a, a concerted, focused, substantial collaboration uh, to solve this problem on a time scale that needs to be solved, which is in the next few years. So that's what this proposal is all about. So just uh, some, oh, did I do the wrong thing? Um, so just to give you a sense of, of, of why the time is now, um, so this is a, a, a plot that shows uh, the growth of data in radio astronomy um, uh, from 2000 to 2030. This is a, a logarithmic plot here. This is a terabyte, that's a petabyte, that's an exabyte. And this is showing the size, this is the size of data sets that are coming to astronomers doing large projects on, on radio astronomy facilities around the world. This is per project. Per project. Yeah. 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 And so, so Meerkat uh, is here, and you see that uh, Meerkat is smack dab in the middle of the petabyte era. The, the data sets coming out for the large projects on Meerkat are petabyte scale. Would you use uh, I would, but I <laughs> just chose my favorites. <laughs> There, there are things missing here, like VLBI is also missing. It's also entering the petabyte era. Uh, um, and in the optical, of course, the the, uh, the big project coming, and uh, David mentioned it, is the large synoptic survey telescope, uh, which on a similar time scale, the early 2020s, is going to be ramping up uh, to produce data on large area surveys of the sky. Um, apparently about 15 terabytes per night of image data uh, to address a large number of goals. Uh, and the LSD data size is 20 terabytes or so of image data per night. Uh, transient alerts in the millions per night, terabyte, terabyte of uh, transient alert data sets. So these DSK Pathfinder projects and the LSST combined are really the, the big challenges in petascale astronomy for multi-wavelength and multi-messenger science. Right? Um, and those are the, are the drivers for this collaboration. But of course, there are lots of other big data projects uh, among the BRICS partner countries which will benefit um, from, uh, from this development. Okay, so we put together this proposal. Uh, it's big data research infrastructure collaboration towards the SKA. Um, this, this proposal evolved from the consideration of the SK as the driver of big data. And so we kept that name primarily because I like the acronym, BRICSCA. Uh, but really, it's a proposal moving BRICS into the petascale astronomy era. Right? And uh, for a broad range of science, 
including the square kilometer array. Uh, these are the five uh, project leaders from the uh, five countries. And when David mentioned that he has over 60 people on his proposal, I quickly added up mine. It's 59 uh, collaborators uh, on the proposal um, as submitted. So it's quite a, quite a large team and a large uh, amount of interest in solving these problems among the BRICS partner countries. So how is this relevant to the, very, to the BRICS uh, collaborators? <clears throat> well, three of the, three of the BRICS <coughs> uh, partner countries, South Africa, China, and India, are direct participants in the Square Climate Array project. Uh, and each of them has built, or just completed the construction of new facilities which are driving really big data in, in radio astronomy. For South Africa, it's MIRCAP, which is the first part of the mid-frequency SK-1. In India, they've just gone through a, a massive upgrade to the GMRT telescope, which is now producing terabyte scale data sets each night. And in China, they've just finished uh, construction of the largest single-dish telescope in the world, FAST, which is going to survey the sky in continuum and atomic hydrogen and produce very large data sets. So each one of them made a, made a major investment in, in facilities. Uh, they're, they're beginning large projects on these facilities, which drive uh, petascale data sets. And we have, through bilateral programs over the last two to three years, already worked together to define collaborative projects. We're bringing the data from these telescopes together uh, to, to, to enhance the science of each individual facility uh, and to uh, really pathfind uh, how the SK is going to do science. So those, those science projects um, will be supported by, by these developments. The science project can't happen without these developments. Here, here in Brazil, uh, there's substantial investment and involvement in the, in the large synoptic survey telescope. And there are teams here, for instance, at the laboratory, the National Laboratory for Scientific Computing. I apologize for the error up there. Um, that has lots of expertise in the kind of uh, data science um, innovations and approaches to big data um, that will benefit bringing together LSST data and SK data. Uh, so we're very keen to, to engage with Brazil. Um, and in Russia, uh, Russia is not part of the SKA uh, and also not part of the LSST, uh, but they do have emerging big data challenges. Uh, for instance, the uh, Prasino Radio Astronomy Observatory has been doing an all-sky monitoring program for several years now uh, at low frequencies that has many spectral channels, high time resolution, and producing data sets for the sitting at the observatory uh, which uh, need to be mined for, for science and, uh, and brought together with other large data sets. So if you put it all together, um, all of the five BRICS countries have invested in facilities uh, and are generating data sets uh, of the several terabytes to petabyte scale uh, and would benefit from a collaboration to figure out how to use that data and to do the science. So those are facilities producing those big data sets uh, the other aspect of the petabyte scale era of astronomy is the way astronomy is now done. Uh, the, we, we, we no longer have small, small telescopes producing small data for, for small PI teams. We have unique global facilities which are going addressing key pressing science questions that the whole world agrees is the, is the, are the big science questions of the day. Um, and they're doing it through cl global collaboration. So these are, are teams scattered all over the world, accessing data from individual facilities, and those data sets are petascale in size. So it fundamentally changes the way we do science. It's not the individual PI anymore, it's global teams. Um, and Meerkat in, in South Africa uh, is working to that paradigm. It's, it's identified um, eight large survey projects, uh, which Meerkat will dedicate uh, about 70% of its time to over the next five years. Each project has typically 1,000 or more hours of observing time, and each project produces a petascale data set. Uh, and uh, here's Patrick's project. There's a project that I'm involved in. Um, and each of these projects are global collaboration. This is a distribution of, of countries, numbers of researchers involved in these projects. Um, and so you see that 
this, this way of doing science changes the dynamic of, for scientific leadership. It's no longer the individual PI that comes up with an idea, writes a paper, and gets a, you know, a, a nice science result out of it. It's global teams working on big data sets. And if you can't work with the data, you're not going to do the science. So being able to have leadership in, in science in your country or among a team means that you need to be able to work with the petascale data sets. And if you can't, then the places that can are, are where the scientific leadership is going to reside. And you can see here there's the UK, there's the US. Uh, in South Africa, we've been very keen to build up the capacity to do it so that we can process all that Meerkat data and do the science in South Africa. Otherwise, it would all be done in the UK. So that's the situation we're faced with. New sociology of astronomy, new challenging big data sets. Um, and we need a new approach. Right? So I like this quote. It's from a, a book written by Al Gore. The uh, book is called The Future of Six Drivers of Global Change. And he talks about the six things that are happening in the world which will fundamentally change society and the way human beings live and work. And one of those, of course, is the digital revolution, uh, now called the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And the Fourth Industrial Revolution is interesting because it's, it's, it's the... It's the reason we have this problem. It's the reason why we can produce petascale data sets. But it also has within it the solutions to the problem. Right? We need to harness the fourth industrial revolution technologies to solve the problem produced by the fourth industrial revolution technologies. And one of those ch changes that are happening is we're moving away from projects which are hierarchical in nature with a boss and a bunch of people down, down a chain of command, each with a little role in the project, uh, to a collaborative, a global sort of horizontal collaborative model of, 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 uh, of working on projects, right? crowdsourcing and, and global collaborations where uh, the, the fourth industrial revolution, the internet and the cloud have enabled a new way of collaboration. Right? And it, that's what we need to tap into to solve these problems. So uh, I break down um, the challenges that we're faced with as rising from this new dynamic into four. Uh, one is we need to be able to collaborate and share and jointly execute projects around with global distributed teams on petascale data sets, which no individual person can have on their desktop. They have to sit out there somewhere uh, and be worked upon. Uh, we have the, the just traditional problem of how do, how do we deal with the, the data sets. Uh, that's a, a, mostly an engineering problem. Then we have the fact that we have to fuse many, many different big data sets. Right? The, the square kilometer array data, the radio astronomy continuum data sets or images coming out of the SKA are semi-useless without multi-wavelength data sets, right? without optical and infrared data as well. Uh, I say semi because some people might not agree with me. Uh, but clearly the science is, is tremendously enhanced um, by bringing in multi-wavelength data sets. And so we have petascale optical, petascale data, radio. It just exacerbates the problem. And then we have the idea, how do you empower the end user to work with this? Right? It's, uh, what we want is, is for me to be able to work with that data, even though it's petascale, as if it was small. Uh, how, do, how do we build systems to allow us to do that so that uh, those teams that are distributed all over the world can actually work with that data uh, and don't have to live in an HPC? So I'm going to talk a little bit about what's been happening in South Africa on this front, what we've been working on. Uh, as sort of an example of the kind of initiatives that we propose will be part of this Global BRICS collaboration. And one of the key ones is cloud. Um, the cloud technology we see as fundamentally central uh, to solving this problem of how people can collaborate around the world on big data sets. Um, it's what makes you know, all the wonderful things you can do with your phone possible is, is, is cloud. Uh, so we have built uh, a, what we call a data intensive research cloud um, in South Africa. Uh, which is a collaboration between several universities uh, and the uh, DERISA, which is uh, funded by the DST, and uh, along with the DST, D-H-E-T, D, whatever it is now. Um, and so this, this is scaled to be able to work with the Meerkat Large Survey Project. So it, we, we've produ produced uh, a facility with sufficient resources, um, we think, to be able to work with the Meerkat Large Survey Programs. Uh, and these are the programs which we are currently supporting. Uh, and 
you see there's a broad range. It's not just one science project. It's, it's, it's transient science. It's developing pipelines for making images. It's uh, visualization of large data sets. It's multi-wavelength data. Right? So what we're talking about is building facilities which support a broad range of science, not just one, one particular kind of science. And it's flexible enough to offer the, the ability to work with the big data sets. Uh, so basically, this is the cloud. I won't go into the details. The, the stuff over here that you don't have to see is, is, is there. Uh, and we access the cloud through a number of platforms. We have a, a visualization platform allows, allowing you to visualize data that's in the cloud. Uh, we have a Jupyter Notebook environment, which allows you to run uh, notebook programs on the big data sets. All those, all those notebooks see the petascale data sets behind them uh, and fire up the, uh, the high performance computing uh, through virtualization and containers. So it's a way to allow uh, researchers to work with the data uh, and not have to worry about the fact that it's uh, very, very large. Okay. So we have, uh, we've been operating this system now for about a year. And you see we have researchers from South Africa, but also from all over the world using this facility, even though they're not in South Africa. So it, it actually works as a, as a remote uh, facility that allows people to work with data as if it was local. Um, one of the things we've done is we've developed a pipeline to turn Meerkat data into images. Uh, I won't dwell on the, uh, but here, here is one of the Meerkat very deep continuum images. Each one of these, these everything you can see on here is a radio source. Uh, we're seeing radio emission from galaxies in the very, very distant universe. And this image is very striking um, as, a, as a deep image of the sky and the radio. But for me, it also points out the fact that how, how do you interpret this? You interpret this by correlating that with mostly wavelength data. So we need images from instru instruments like Mirlik from the LSST telling us what, in fact, these things are. Uh, no, these are uh, classical radio galaxies, black hole AGNs and radio lobes. And historically in radio astronomy, uh, these tend to be the brighter objects in the image. And that's typically what radio astronomers studied. Now, the, going very, very deep in the radio, we're beginning to see normal galaxies. Right? So really, we're entering an era for the first time where radio astronomers and optical astronomers are actually studying the same things. Um, and of course, when we're talking about uh, these pedestal data sets, how do we analyze them? How do we mine them? How do we extract the information? It requires new approaches, uh, like machine learning. So we have a machine learning platform for machine learning on the cloud, and we're developing uh, with students approaches for trying to analyze and classify uh, all the objects we're seeing in these images. The other powerful thing about this cloud approach is uh, for development and outreach. Because it's like the cloud on your phone, it means you can go anywhere in the world and deliver this access to big data and to algorithms and software to anyone, wherever they are. In disadvantaged place, places that are more disadvantaged, don't have access to high performance computing. And what we've done is we've used the, the cloud um, to run big data schools at remote locations around Africa. Here's one in Madagascar. What you see here, the, the students are sitting in a remote hut in the northern part of Madagascar connected by wireless, uh, and their laptops are connected to the cloud in Cape Town, and they're working on big data projects. Another one in, in, in Botswana. So it's a very powerful platform also um, for outreach uh, and, uh, and development. So this is uh, getting down to the dirty on, on the actual proposal itself. This is the vision. Right? There are Clouds being developed in Europe. There's the European Open, European Open Science Cloud. There's clouds in, in North America. In Canada, they have the CANFAR, which is part of the Compute Canada. Uh, these are being developed and will be used as part of the SKA, uh, Global Enterprise. What I'm imagining is a BRICS network of federated clouds for big data and astronomy. That's sort of the end goal of, of what we're working towards. Uh, and this is for collaborative development of the technologies for BRICS community to work in this petascale astronomy era. So we have thematic areas in the proposal. Um, I'd like to point out it's science-driven. We're not just building something in the abstract. We're building it to work on real projects. 
Those projects currently are driven my, mostly from the SKA Pathfinders uh, community, uh, and they address the fundamental science question uh, that the SKA will address, including the transit universe, which overlaps quite nicely with uh, David's transient proposal. Uh, we have a thematic area in developing this open, sort of open cloud. Uh, we have one in uh, novel algorithms and data science for analytics and visualization. And we have one for the development aspect. Uh, so we, we, we plan to structure the project into, into working groups to, uh, around those thematic areas. Um, and uh, it's very similar to the project structure that uh, David proposed. Um, finally, I want to point out that the kind of innovations we're talking about are, is, is greatly of interest to industry. So in our proposal, we identified a, an initial suite of industries which are interested in the project. In India, they have a, an actual long-standing collaboration with industry on their SK efforts. Uh, in Brazil, it's Petrobras and, and Dell. In South Africa, the Space Advisory Company. Uh, and in China, the Alibaba. Uh, and just, just an example, so I had a, I had a meeting with a uh, representative from the Space Advisory Company about a week ago to talk about the nature of the kind of collaboration. And I asked him to send me a couple of slides about how they would plan to be involved in the project. So I'll just show you a couple examples. So this is their proposal to participate. Um, and the reason they want to participate is to develop capability. This, this company, main bread and butter, is Earth observation. They, 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 they acquire, process, and sell Earth observation uh, imaging. And, and currently, they're getting into uh, synthetic aperture radar. So they see what we're doing as something that's very relevant to their core business plan. Um, they want to collaborate with us in a non-commercial means, which means it's, it's a collaborative research effort. Uh, with, uh, it's not a contract. It's not a commercial arrangement. Uh, they expect to, to see, see the reward as, as a future shared opportunities and intellectual property that they can then use for their own benefit. Uh, and they really want to work with us to create momentum to build this project as a successful project. So this is one of the socioeconomic benefits that uh, one can imagine uh, very realistically uh, applying to this project. Okay, so this is my final slide. Next steps. Um, the budget for this proposal is quite similar to uh, one David pointed out for, for annual meetings, postdocs, and graduate fellowships, similar numbers, staff to make it all work, and a, and a program of outreach and development to realize the socioeconomic benefits of what we're doing. And what we'd like to do is kick off next year uh, with a, uh, an annual meeting, our first annual meeting, to define the project and move it forward, and then ramp up the full project in 2021. So that's, that's it. OK. Thank you, Russ. <laughs> Questions? Uh, we know that there are uh, many initiatives, uh, including uh, explicitly the participation of si uh, science or citizen science, as we have now in the uh, Einstein home for gravitational waves, for example. Is this uh, citizen science in the branch of the SKA uh, big data? Um. Yes, it certainly is one of, one of the avenues that uh, we should explore. And there have been some programs. Uh, there, there is a, a Radio Galaxy Zoo citizen science program, which asks for help uh, with the citizens to classify these weird shapes of radio galaxies and also identify counterparts. So there, there are opportunities like that that we would exploit. Yeah, thank, hello. Yeah, thanks for your talk. Very interesting. Uh, yeah, just uh, playing a little bit of the devil's advocate. Uh, there was a recent, I mean, earlier this year, there was a recent um, um, study of nature papers over the decades. You may be familiar with it. Studying large teams versus uh, small teams. And apparently the conclusion was that the, uh, even though, of course, as you, as you put out very conclusively that large teams are important, they, you know, 
you know, we've seen LIGO, CERN, uh, Planck, uh, you know, uh, um, and so, so on. Um, they are less likely, apparently, to, uh, to promote innovations. Uh, so in there, that's an area that where the, you know, small teams uh, play a role, apparently. You want to comment on that? Yeah, I will comment on that. Uh, I, th I fully agree with you that uh, small teams can be very productive if they have the tools to, to do their science. Um, but I think the, the issue is that we're just moving into an era where the small teams are just no longer the paradigm. It's no longer the way that science is done because of the, we're moving to these big facilities producing big data sets. And that model doesn't work for those large programs. What it does work for is, is, is in legacy projects. Right? So, so many of these large projects produce legacy data sets. And those legacy data sets are then mined by small teams. Right? And what those small teams then need, of course, is the software to be able to um, do that mining of the legacy data sets. So I, I think that uh, we're moving into this new era. Initially, it's, it's dealing with the big data among the large teams. But in the longer term, it's, it's legacy data and software and systems that allow individual researchers to work with legacy data sets. Uh, Russ, I have a question about uh, the basic principles. It's the proposal is oriented for SKA mainly. Is it possible to use, I mean, the ideas for optical uh, network? Because wide field astronomy is also a source of big data. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree with you. It's a question. <laughs> no, no, well, uh, the answer is yes to your question. Uh, the proposal emerged from, from, from an SKA perspective, but I think it, it, the applicability is much, much broader than the SKA. Um, and we want to address the SKA and the LSST scale problem, uh, but, I, but I believe that the platforms and the systems we build will be useful for a broad range of projects. And I would, I would like to think that maybe at our first project meeting next year, we do a more, exp more expansive sort of census of, of the kind of projects which would be impacted by what we're doing and, and would benefit from it. Uh, hi, Rose. Uh, I want to know how the, the graduate fellowship can be integrated to the SKA. I am in the undergraduate school in astrophysics, and I want to know how the graduate fellowship can be integrated so the project. I'm not sure I understand your... Oh, oh, undergraduate. Yes. Ah, um, good question. Um, we, we currently do have undergraduate students working uh, in IDEA uh, and, and Elifu on, on projects. Um, it's probably worthwhile considering whether we should have a funding stream to, to fund earlier stage projects or students in the project. Good point. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask a more technical question. Um, from from like the uh, budget sheet uh, we see here, there's no um, allocated funding in, in this, this proposal for hardware. For which? For hardware. Yeah. So my question is, are you proposing to rely on hardware of each facility to fulfill the cloud computing uh, function or you rely on something else? Uh, the answer is yes, we are relying on um, building the, the cloud nodes at the five countries that existing facilities. Um, and uh, the proposal sort of articulates that in more detail, but we, we do have the directors of, the, of relevant facilities on the proposal. So, so in India, they're, they're building an SK data center that will be a part of this. In China, the Shanghai Observatory, the SK Regional Center facility will go there, it will be part of this. Uh, they have, we have the Laboratory for Scientific Computing here in Brazil, we have Ilifu in South Africa. Uh, it's not clear uh, what, what the Russian component would be, but uh, we, we will rely on, on existing facilities. If we expand beyond the capacity um, for those facilities to deal with the data, then uh, expansion will be, will be required. Uh, but we haven't built that into this budget. But do you worry about the possible problem when you have hardware at specific facilities? Because of the volume of the data, it's large. It's difficult to do it over the cloud. Uh, that's actually 
uh, I think what we're demonstrating is that's not the case, that the cloud actually is a good solution. Because the, the Meerkat large survey projects are, be, are being well served, I think, by, by the cloud technology. Patrick, you can maybe speak to that a bit. Oh, so I, I like the way you propose the cloud as a uh, way of enabling the BRICS to enter in this new uh, paradigm of science with big data. It's basically, that's the, the background that is, that is on, that's the immediate benefit. Now, my question is, um, I mean, there is a clear interface with the project that was just presented. So could you detail a little bit more how your project could uh, facilitate or the things that you are going to develop in your projects could reduce the cost and make the progress of the optical network, for example, faster and better? Uh, I, I think that's a conversation we need to talk about in detail. Um, but I, I can imagine, I mean, one of, the, one, of the, one of the aspects of the federated cloud is, is, is it brings data from many different places together into one sort of e-environment. So, so to the degree that you want to be able to bring data from many different sources together uh, for people to, to analyze, the infrastructure would do that. Um, one thing we have talked about is, is the, how, do you, how you manage all the LSST events. Uh, and so we would plan to build uh, a system which would allow um, the researchers on the transient project to make intelligent decisions about the, uh, the events or the coming out of the LSST. So I think that we would we would work together uh, with the transient project uh, to identify what's required and, and build it into our big data infrastructure plan. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is just a general uh, comment, um, I think, across these projects, even the previous one by David, on the social economic uh, section and the benefits uh, given that you know we will be presenting these uh, proposals let's say to the government or whatever so um, so my suggestion because I know that it's very difficult up front uh, for some of these projects to say exactly what will be some of this uh, uh, socio-economic uh, you know, impacts and uh, things like that. But maybe what we can do, uh, as I, I discussed with David during the break, that maybe we can list things that we know as uh, astronomy has impacted on previously. Some of the technologies that have become mainstream and uh, of use today to d in day-to-day -day life. Like, for instance, I can think in radio astronomy, the contributions it has made to accuracy of modern Wi-Fi, GPS systems through VLBI, and I'm sure you guys know many other examples. So maybe we should just, up front, we should just uh, put, you know, statements like those, because I think to the someone who is reading who needs to make a, a decision, I think that is very important. And I know we can borrow some of the things from the IAU office of uh, Kevin Gavender, because I think they've done a lot of research. Like I, I remember he used to have one slide which shows you how astronomy impacts on the Millennium Development Goals uh, of the UN. In just one slide, you know, you can see how. So um, I'm just saying that I think that we do have in available information that can strengthen that section. But also upon reflection, I think that although we provided this template, which was very technical, but maybe up front in the preface of the proposal, we can already start mentioning those things up front, um, you know, so that it, it really shows that astronomy can, in the long term, uh, impact society. And then we then go into the... But I think those are things that uh, I think for me will just be improving the, I don't know whether you call it the cosmetics, <laughs> uh, you know, of the not so much maybe the content, but I think it's something that we can look at here. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, I think it's important that we put some money into that particular aspect as well, that, that there actually is 
a program to, to realize social benefit, social economic benefit, and we fund it. Okay, thank you, Russ. Okay. Ariana, please. Ah. Russ, the, the microphone, please. Oh. Yeah, So thank you a lot for having me here today. Um, it's a great pleasure to present you this work, uh, which has been uh, developed uh, mostly at IAG, but is a collaboration of many um, institutions in Brazil. And the PI of the project is Claudia Mendes de Oliveira. And I'm going to first present you this project in general, because I hope it can inspire some of you to join in because it's uh, open to everybody in the world. So it could be a good project for BRICS, I presume. And then I will present in specifically what I am doing. So as I was saying, first I'm going to describe the S plus survey and then uh, the work I'm doing on lenticular galaxies in Stripe 82. So S plus stands for Southern Photometric Local Universe Survey. And uh, it has been developed also through the help of CEFCA, that is our counterpart in Europe, in Spain. And um, it is uh, a 83 centimeter telescope. It is very compact, as you can see here. But it has a 1.4 uh, field of view in the camera and uh, 12 <gasps> filters, five broadband filters, and seven narrowband filters. It is mounted in Cerro Tololo in CTIO, is this building here. And before, for curiosity, this is what was in the place of T80 South. And uh, it's going to map uh, 7,900 degrees of the southern sky, as you can see here. In red is the main survey, in blue is the galactic survey, and in yellow are the Magellanic Cloud. The field squares are the part of the sky that have been already covered by the S plus, uh, by T80 South. And in here, uh, we compare the area that will be observed by T80 with the uh, other uh, survey of the southern hemisphere, as you might know, there are several of them, and they are all uh, nicely complementary. And um, in here, I compare the difference between the area that uh, the survey will cover and the photometric depth uh, of all these different survey, and S plus is here. And we have a first data release that is uh, available online at this link, and uh, the data are public, so please use them. Uh, they are also available in Data Lab, in case you are interested. And this is the first filter system. As I was saying before, there are five broadband filters that are like in SDSS, and seven narrowband filters that are located in some specific uh, wavelengths that are good to determine stellar population properties, as for example, H alpha. So this is an example of one image uh, taken from S plus. So it's 1.4 degree per side. And uh, as you can see, uh, the sky is full of objects when you look at such big uh, area. But it's possible to zoom in and investigate each one of them, in this case, a galaxy, and even the center of the galaxy. And um, 
uh, in here I'm presenting uh, the uh, magnitude depth of the survey for the G and R band uh, as an example for different signal to noise. So we will go till 21.62 for low signal to noise and then for higher signal to noise, uh, of course the magnitude depth uh, will decrease. But we will be uh, basically complete in number of galaxies uh, almost uh, till 16 in magnitude R. And uh, also uh, for uh, the local universe, we will get uh, almost all the galaxies. What is very interesting uh, of uh, this uh, multi-wavelength approach is that even if uh, through photometry is possible to get uh, an SCD of the galaxy very similar to a spectrum. So in here is the wavelength, and uh, in here is the SCD, so the spectral energy distribution of different objects, uh, a quasar, a star, a galaxy, and a planetary nebula, for example, or a symbiotic star. So using these uh, 12, na 12 filters, it's going to be possible to understand which objects we are looking at. And here are some examples of uh, the type of science is possible to do with this plus uh, by using this filter system. And of course, there are many others that you might think of, and we are very happy to hear about. So a possibility is to look for quasars, as uh, seen here. Using this combination of filter, it's possible to separate quasar from galaxies and stars in this color-color diagram. And in a very similar manner, in here it's possible to identify the planetary nebulae. These are models of where we expect to find halo planetary nebulae uh, against the other objects that you might identify in a great area of the sky. And also, it's possible to uh, find low metallicity stars that are highlighted in this color color diagram in here in uh, blue, which are uh, uh, extremely interesting uh, to understand the evolution of stars. And uh, there is also a galactic survey, as I was showing you before. And this here is possible to see how rich uh, are the data in this type of, uh, in this part of the sky and how difficult it is to analyze them as well. And uh, finally, uh, these are two galaxies, uh, a galaxy and a globular cluster, also observed uh, with uh, S plus. And uh, uh, these are all the projects uh, that are now uh, being conducted by the group, but more projects uh, are welcome to be proposed. Or in case somebody is interested in a project that is already ongoing, it can just uh, enter. It's just contacting us. And uh, there are also several uh, PhD theses uh, that are uh, being carried out using this data. So to conclude, uh, for now, we have observed only 23% of the area, but, uh, I can see. but uh, it's going to be completed for 2023. And uh, a first paper has been published that presents uh, all the data set that are already published on Stripe 82 and the telescope and the survey in general. And this leads us to the second part of my talk, uh, which is in direct collaboration with Professor Kanaksa and uh, his student uh, in Ayuka. I am actually now at the Observatorio do Valongo here in uh, Rio de Janeiro. And uh, what we are trying to do is to compare, uh, to combine S plus data and SDSS uh, deep data of Stripe 82 to investigate the origin of lenticular galaxies, but also, as I'm going to show you, to be able to understand if a galaxy is a lenticular galaxy. For example, this is a very deep image of a lenticular galaxy. And as you can see, when you start uh, looking uh, in depth, you can really see all the accretion that have going on around the galaxy. And therefore, it sometimes becomes so even complicated to 
uh, identifies the morphology of a galaxy. So these are a lot of galaxies that are possible to see in our uh, universe from early type to late type galaxies. And they are generally uh, assembled through the Hubble Galaxy Classification Scheme. So we go from round and red and dead, as they say, elliptical toward blue and uh, star forming spiral galaxies. And in here are uh, the lenticular galaxies, which can be barred as a spiral or unbarred. So to understand the, the formation of a zero galaxies, there have been several works in the past, from uh, a first work of Dressler in the 80s, where he uh, counted the number of galaxies going towards the center of a cluster. So here is the cluster density increasing, and here is the number of objects. In blue are spiral galaxies, in black are lenticular, and in red elliptical galaxy. And what you can see is that while the number of spiral galaxies decreases going towards the center of a cluster, the number of lenticular increase as much as the number of elliptical. Other works, uh, always from Dressler in the 97 or Wilman et al. in 2009 in groups instead of cluster, show that this same behavior is possible to be uh, seen even with redshift. So here we have different redshift beams going from 0 to 0 0.8. And this is the number of lenticular galaxies divided by the number of uh, uh, elliptical galaxies. And you can see that the number of lenticular galaxies decreases with redshift. And this same behavior is possible to see also in groups, while the number of spiral galaxies seems to increase with redshift. And this is found in groups as much as in clusters. And this led to the idea that the zero will be stripped spiral galaxies. Here you have to make an exercise of imagining a spiral galaxy. And uh, what happens is that you strip the spiral arms and get to something that looks like a lenticular galaxy with a bulge and a disk. But we have in the universe isolated lenticular galaxies and very massive lenticular galaxies that can be hardly interpreted as stripped spirals. Therefore, several other theories were proposed to understand the origin of lenticular galaxies. One is equal or unequal mass merger that could create the same, uh, more or less the same structure. And another possibility is that they are formed at higher redshift, around two, by the merge of clumps present in high redshift galaxies. So what you will have is that these clumps will merge, will move towards the center of the galaxy because of dynamical friction, merge and create a bulge, while in the outer part you will still have a disk. And this is a cartoon exemplifying how, depending on how cold is the disk, uh, you have a different evolution of the galaxy. So when the disk is very cold, it can fragment in a lot uh, of uh, pieces, which will merge and create uh, at the redshift, uh, uh, lower redshift, the galaxy that is similar to a lenticular. So to prove how they form, uh, you know, having all these possibility that uh, recently have been uh, uh, associated to difference in mass. So you will have high mass lenticular galaxies that form through mergers and low mass lenticular galaxies that form through stripping or they could be primordial galaxies that form through disk instabilities. To really understand what's going on, you need to have a large sample of data with a different environment and different masses. And for this, you need a large survey so ICE Plus is an ideal laboratory for this kind of studies. Also because we will have photometric redshift with a great precision and photometric SCD as I was showing you before. So here is just to give an idea of uh, the value that resides in color in multi-wavelength approach to astronomy. Probably you all agree already. But as you can see, galaxy can look very different when you put color in it, and color can really help you 
in understanding the nature of an object. So these are some galaxies seen from uh, uh, with S plus, and uh, it's not easy to really say what is a lenticular galaxy when you study galaxies in an automated way, because for example, here are a lenticular and uh, an early type galaxy, and when you see lenticular galaxy phase on, it really looks like uh, an elliptical. On the other side, when you see it uh, very edge on, like this one, that's the one I was showing you before in deeper uh, images, in a deeper image. Well, this one also has a dust lane, but anyway, when you look at a lenticular edge on, it can really resemble a spiral galaxy. And if it's hard for a human eye to understand, it's also hard for an automated uh, routine. So we took uh, these galaxies from Stripe 82, which are brighter than 17 magnitudes in our band. And uh, we matched them uh, also because Galaxy Zoo um, SDSS comes with the analysis from Galaxy Zoo, which is a citizen science based uh, uh, work that allow to divide galaxies in various categories. So we have a kind of morphological information. And uh, what we want to do is compare these two data set because SDSS data are 1.6 or 1.8 magnitude deeper than S plus and can be almost kind of simulated better data. So we can check the accuracy of S plus data the accuracy of the parameter we extract as the probability of being galaxies, uh, the Bayesian spectral type, which is basically the SCD of the galaxy, and also the ability that we have using uh, uh, some codes to recover the Petrosian radius, the concentration, and other type of parameters. So we run Morphometrica, that's a code developed by Fabrizio Ferrari, in Rio Grande do Sul on uh, both samples for all the galaxy brighter than 17. And this is an example of what Morphometrica does. It takes a galaxy and then uh, computes several uh, non-parameters uh, measures uh, of the galaxy light. So for example, we have concentration, the Petrosian radius, uh, we have uh, uh, spirality, which comes from uh, a azimuthal projection of the galaxy light and is a measure of the presence or not of uh, spiral arm and substructure in the galaxy. And uh, several other parameters. And we compare them between uh, S plus and SDSS. So in here, I'm showing you the good comparison, which are from the CERSIC index in S plus and in SDSS, uh, they are kind of in agreement, especially for bright galaxies. And concentration is also well recovered by the S plus data as much as the Petrosian radius and the quantity called entropies, that is a, a measure of the um, variation of uh, pixel fluctuation in the image, which uh, is shifted, but uh, yet, is uh, in agreement with what found in SDSS. While we realize that some uh, parameters as asymmetry and spirality uh, varies a lot between S plus and SDSS due to the fact that SDSS is deeper and has a, a tinier pixel scales of 0 0.2 while S plus is only 0 0.55. So we moved on and we tried to see if we can really classify galaxies using uh, an automated approach or a beginning of an automated approach. And uh, here is just to remind you of Galaxy Zoo. So Galaxy Zoo will give in general the possibility of people to select between various categories that goes from early type round to early type intermediate. This is cigar shaped object edge on object, spiral, and spiral with bar. This is a simple class. Then they have many more uh, ramifications, but these are the basic simple class that they provide with a probability, of course. And this is an example of a round elliptical, an intermediate, a cigar shape elliptical, edge on galaxy, spiral, and bar spiral. 
And uh, what instead we have from uh, S plus is the Bayesian spectral type that comes from fitting the spectral energy distribution of the galaxy, assuming that we have several templates of a galaxy uh, light from early type to late type galaxies. And uh, in the moment you define the photometric redshift, you also define which is the spectral template that better uh, interpret the data. So we wanted to compare the class that comes from Galaxy Zoo with what comes from the Bayesian spectral type, hoping to finding a relationship, you know, even a very uh, smooth relationship, or since they are discrete data, a discrete relationship. But we find this, which basically means that uh, the SCD and the morphological uh, class describe two different uh, uh, aspects of a galaxy. One is the stellar population, and the other one is the appearance. In here, I'm uh, coloring uh, the dots with uh, B over A. So, of course, early type galaxies uh, ha are round, and the edge on are uh, edge on, so they have a very low B over A. But apart from that, also when we look at the color, we can see that in this case, for the Bayesian spectral type, there is a strong correlation between the color and the uh, spectral type. But we don't find any cor well, we don't find a strict correlation between these two parameters. We tried with a student uh, in Valongo to see if we can find a match between these two classes. So we decreased the number of the Bayesian spectral type to six and tried to match them with what comes out from Galaxy Zoo. And in this way, we found 22 possible lenticular galaxies. I'm showing some of them here. And we also found something that I think is very interesting, that are the objects that are uh, uh, misclassified, meaning, for example, that uh, they are an elliptical cigar shape for uh, Galaxy Zoo, but their spectra is typical of a barred spiral or you have objects that uh, look like elliptical, but again, they have a spectral type of a bar spiral. Or, for example, you can have an object that uh, looks like uh, a spiral, but uh, has an elliptical uh, uh, spectral type. And I believe this object here looks round, but if you could go deeper as SDSS go, it would be like this one. I don't know if you can see that is actually a red spiral. So basically, to conclude, uh, in here I'm showing you uh, two parameters that are the output of morphometrica. That is concentrations versus entropy. So concentration is almost a proxy of the CERSIC index. It tells you how concentrated is the light uh, in the inner part of the galaxy. And the entropy uh, is telling you how smooth the galaxy. So when they are clumpy, they have a high entropy. And when they're smooth, a low entropy. And here I'm color coding them for their Bayesian, Bayesian spectral type. And as you can see, it seems that these two parameters are doing good in separating uh, early type uh, galaxy in, uh, for what matters with the SED and uh, galaxies that are still star forming. And uh, this gets a bit lost as possibly to understand why instead of color coding them with uh, the Bayesian spectral time, we use uh, the classification from Galaxy Zoo. So to conclude, in the future, we want to explore different parameters from Morphometrica to see if we can understand if a galaxy is a, has a one component or more. And uh, we want to try also to run GALFITEM, which is a parametric fit to some of these galaxies. Can't be run for all because it's too time consuming for now. And finally, S plus is open to an international community through uh, programs. And everybody is very welcome to join, just uh, contacting us. And uh, this is the web page. The PI is Claudia Mendes de Oliveira, and this is her email. So if you have any idea on how to use in the data or you want to collaborate, please uh, contact. Thank you, Ariana. Very interesting.
Questions? Well, uh, yes, David. Maybe I have a, a few questions. So maybe I missed, but what is your uh, completeness of your catalog up, uh, up to Redshift? What's the, uh, hand, what's the completeness uh, uh, of your catalog against Redshift? Is, uh, is local. We don't go. Yeah, yeah, nevertheless. I have a plot, I have a plot. Because uh, okay. you show the completeness about uh, brightness, but not against uh, redshift. So it's very local. So it's really like complete. Is really yeah. All point one is still good. It, but you see, it also depends on the error you can accept to have in the photometric redshift. Yeah. So, so if you want small error, you need uh, to go to very local universe. But uh, so in that case, uh, uh, my second question: Can you use your catalog for a target uh, of uh, LIGO Virgo uh, sources uh, survey? Like uh, variable? Uh, no, no. Uh, so uh, LIGA uh, and uh, VIRGO supply yeah, a yeah, huge yeah. area uh, localization. So you have a completeness, your catalog up to 0.1. It's uh, well excess any uh, uh, binary internal star merging. So uh, can you use uh, 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 your catalog uh, just for targeted survey? Uh, yes. And uh, actually, it has been used as plus data has been used to. Uh, but it is not used in Glade. It, uh, okay, so sorry, sorry, continue. They have been used uh, as a follow up after the first detection of uh, um, the um, uh, gravitational wave. As plus data has been used to trace it. So, yeah, it's possible. Okay, maybe I missed, but uh, thank you for. No, uh, I didn't your say it actually. For your uh, talk. <laughs> Uh, just a comment that uh, I talked to Claudia, that is the PI of the this project, and uh, also you have several opportunities to engage. One is engaging the ongoing projects. Second is, as Ariana said, proposing some projects for that survey. And in three or four years, the telescope will finish the survey. And uh, the team that manages the telescope, they are looking for art for new projects. So the telescope will be there as well for projects. OK, thank you very much. And uh, we stop now for lunch. And uh, we come back at 2 o'clock. If you want to leave your laptops inside, no problem. We will lock the door. But if you return before 2, you will find the, lock, the door locked. So it's up to you. If you want to leave your laptop, can leave. But the door will be locked until 2. Uh, just Leaving the, the gate on your left, walking 300 meters is the shopping mall. You can find the restaurants there. The BRICS delegates, please, the buses outside, so meters and the bus. <laughs>